All right, so let's do a review real quickly of our homework. Uh, last week, we laid down some um, biblical truth, the foundation that we're going to do this whole, base this whole study on. And uh, the verse that we are letting uh, shape, basically, how we're going to address wisdom was the verse in Proverbs 9.10. It's also written in 1.7, and it's also in Psalm 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I'm going to ask you, assuming you guys did your homework, how might you know if you have, because you'll have to have a definition of what the fear of the Lord is, okay? So how might you know if you have the fear of the Lord in your life? In other words, what words might describe what your heart would look like, what your thoughts might look like? Hey, Mickey Hicks. <laughs> what your actions and life might demonstrate if you have a healthy fear of the Lord. So you can just say, I would, I would think this, I would do this, I would feel this. So that's going to describe what, define what that word fear of the, that phrase fear of the Lord is. What would that be? Okay, total admiration and following his ways. What else? Okay, awareness. You were going to say something? That. that, okay. Okay, so you hear the, the phrases, it's not just what you, the warm fuzzies, or it's not just I'm scared of God, or wow, I just really adore God. It follows up with a, obedience. It follows up with an action, a, an awareness all day, every day about it. So those who fear the Lord have, um, have this continual awareness and a loving all filled de deep reverence for him and a sincere commitment to obey him. So what biblical text did we use last week, if you recall, to cite a good, um, a very good practical laying down of it? It was in the Old Testament. Do you remember it? There we go. Deuteronomy. All right. And who's saying it? Moses. And he, it's a great passage. And he talks about the fear of... The fear of the Lord is this, that you love him and serve him with all your heart and soul. And then he goes on to say that he is your praise. He's your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things. Then next, we, fit, we followed up with the fear of the Lord starts what? It's the beginning of what? Wisdom. wisdom. So what did we deduce from that? That you're not just gifted with wisdom. It's just the beginning of wisdom. It's the path on which we're going to start. And it's, it's going to be taking into our lives a careful consideration of how we walk. We talked about that last week all through Ephesians. And what example do we have of someone who had wisdom? The Lord granted wisdom, but he did not continue to walk in wisdom. Who was Solomon? We saw at the beginning of his life, he still, ta he still called the wisest man in the face of the world, but we see clear evidence that as he walked on through his life, he began to walk away from God's word. So wisdom isn't once wise, always wise, right? Wisdom is something that you're deciding, I am going to walk in obedience to my love of the Lord, in obedience to it. So uh, now let's go ahead and define our phrases. Knowledge. What was knowledge? gathering facts. Now, how is wisdom different than gathering facts? Marty, how's wisdom different than gathering facts? Applying it. Bottom line is it, applying it and applying it just however you think. Okay, thinking of, right, thinking of the best way, like really thinking through what will be the best means to um, accomplish the best goal, the best purpose. So it's a whole broad thing that we're looking at. It. We're going to implement it or not. Okay, now the hard word, post-lapsarian noetic effect. All right, before we go there, who in here uh, does not know what that word means and does not have Herschel's book, First Corinthian book? Who in here? Okay, there you go. <laughs> Chapter 11, you can find out what it is. Now, those of you who do know, Simply, it's funny, I've gotten so many texts this week. Can you tell me again what that meant? <laughs> I got one late last night. It, says, uh, it, it showed me that they put off studying their homework. <laughs> but, but they just said, again, can you tell me what it's? What do, simply, it's really a very simple thing. It's a large word that, that's a bit intimidating. But it's a very simple truth. It's a very simple basic um, 
fact of what humanity is. What is it? Debbie, what you got? There we go. That's it. That's, I mean, you, it, you just, it's really a very basic truth. And now, can't you all see that? Don't you struggle with that? Isn't it clear that the Bible says over and over again different things like think on these things? Why does the Bible have to tell us think on things that are true? Because we think on things that aren't true. Why does it have to say think on things that are lovely? Why, do, why does it say that? Because we dwell on ugly. Ugly. I mean, it's over and if whatsoever is right, whatsoever, think on things that are, you know, it's always encouraging us to work on the way that we think. And so what that's telling us is that we have to figure out how to walk in a way not recognizing that we don't naturally have wisdom. It is not, it doesn't just fall on us because we're followers of Christ and we want it. We have to actively pursue it. So today we're going to expand our study and we're going to look at wisdom by way of the word. You all, there is nothing more life-altering than coming to see God in the pages of this book. This book, this Bible, is first, and be very clear about this, it is first and foremost a book about God. And a lot of times when we read it, we want to read it, and we, uh, we want to put ourselves in the story. And we want to see, well, what's the Bible say to me? How do I come to understand what I need to do? And that, we're, You're approaching the Bible all wrong if you're doing that. The Bible will do that. The Bible does instruct us, encourage us, uh, supply us with wisdom, tell us how we live as friends, as family, how, we be, how we're able to suffer well, how we guide our thoughts, how we guard our speech. But first and foremost, it's the way God is revealing himself to us. It's, God, it's God's words of self-disclosure. It's saying, look at me. Here's who I am. Here's who my son is. Jen Wilkin uses a very good, um, concise way to, that we have to look at when we study the Bible. She gives us this very simple template. Let the Bible speak of God and let the mind transform the heart. Let me say that again. Let the Bible speak of God and let the mind transform the heart. So in essence, God before me and mind before heart. We're wanting, you know, you, you want to, you have to think and read before it can transform your heart. What sometimes we want to do is we want to approach it and we go, Lord, would you just ready my heart? Well, you know what readies your heart more than anything? Reading something that corrects your heart. Because what's the Bible say about our hearts? It's deceitful. We talked a little bit about that last week. That's one of the reasons why it's hard for us to have wisdom. So today we're going to look at the psalmist uh, writing Psalm 119. And I love, love this passage. I hope you guys took the time to read it. Um, there's 176 verses in it. Uh, it's basically what the psalmist is doing is he's writing uh, this acrostic poem. And I'll talk about that in just a second trying to draw us in to this love relationship with God through God's revelation. He's wanting us to be, be enticed, I guess is the word, to go, wow, God's word really is rich. And as we read God's word, we start to understand just how amazing God is. Psalm 119 is one of the eight wisdom psalms. That's why even though technically it is not a wisdom book, it would be a poet book, and when you break it up in genres, this when uh, this book is, I mean, excuse me, this chapter is one of the wisdom chapters. So that's why I decided to go with it. And with 176 six stanzas, it's trying to get us, again, like I like that word, entice us to just find out what a treasure the word of God is. You know, you ever eat at a really good restaurant and you come out and you tell somebody, oh, this was so good. Recently, I had some of the best fried green tomatoes at Ramsey's in Lexington. Does anybody ever have, anybody know Ramsey's? I could, you know, that really is my go-to place. I, I like good home cooking meals. And I came back and I started to describe, I said, man, it's so good. I think they fry them in bacon grease. <laughs> it's so good. They're thin, they're crispy, they're, they're, cooked just right and it's a massive plate like if you get an appetizer of it it's I mean there's maybe like I don't know 18 slices of them so I mean you get a really good hearty portion and they come out piping hot now did I entice you in any way anybody here want 
possibly to go to Ramsey sometime soon and get fried green tomatoes or go make them yourself if you've got green tomatoes now. That's what this psalmist is doing. He's saying things and he's going to keep saying them over and over again in such a way that it makes you go, there's something really good about this. He really gets the value of it. And so he gives us this very, very uh, strong piece of evidence as to the immeasurable value uh, of this psalm in the Bible, and it's through the obvious, the length of this psalm. Did you know it's the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's about the Bible? It has more verses than the book of Galatians. It has more verses than Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians combined, First and Second Timothy combined, Titus, Philemon, James, Jude, First and Second and Third John combined, First and Second Peter combined. And so we'll take sometimes one of those books, and how long do we study through one of those books? We can go for six, 12-week study. Herschel can do it probably a year. <laughs> it just depends just the way he picks that. There's many Old Testament books that are actually shorter than that. So we can deduce by the evidence of its volume that it has a great high value to it. Now we read over it, and because it seems to say the same thing over and over again, we just go, well, it's just says the Bible's a good thing. But you all, it's go, it is so rich. And I'm just going to take a very few verses this morning, and I'm just going to show you how the author of this book or this chapter is going to pull us in and help us understand what it is. Some believe this, though no author is mentioned. You know, you look at your psalms here, and many times it will say for it like uh, a psalm of David or Korah or somebody. It goes through different ones. This one doesn't mention it. I'm not sure why it doesn't mention it. Um, but if it needed to be mentioned, it would be. <laughs> so we're going to go with that. They, they also discern, and I believe this to be true, because just like it would take somebody who wrote one of the books of the, the letters in the New Testament, you don't think that he just sat down and began to pen and he never got up till he finished, right? You think it was probably over a course of time most of them wrote something. Moses didn't just sit down and just sit there and scribe away at it. They wrote it with thought and prayer and meditation and the Holy Spirit's leading into it. So this psalm probably took place over a good period of time, the writing of it, quite possibly even a lifetime. It, it has a definite theme, and it is in praise of God's word. Again, I mentioned earlier, it's in the um, acrostic pattern of the Hebrew alphabet. They have 22 letters. We have 26, right? Yeah, 26. Okay, so they have 22 letters, so it would be like Aleph, Beth, and then it just goes down through each one like we have A, B, C. And what it would do is each 22 sections you, in your Bible, most of you all, will have them divided off, and then it will say Aleph, and then it will give you eight verses, and it will say Bet. So it would be like A, eight verses, B, eight verses, C, all the way down till we get to Z in our alphabet, but they go through, obviously, the Hebrew alphabet. But what you have to notice in it is each line also begins with that letter. So each stanza of each section, so verse 1, we'll start with Aleph. Verse 2, we'll start with Aleph. And they do left to right. Remember Hebrew writing. So you, you could just go down through it. So you can see how this isn't something that's going to just be like, if I were to say to you all this week, I want you to do an acrostic with the English alphabet of God's word. And I want each stanza of eight sentences to flow about God's word. And I want each sentence to say something about the word of God. So you got, that means 176 things you're going to say. And I don't want you to use the same word of God. I want you to call it different things because that's what this author did. He doesn't just use, and the word of God does this. And the word of God is this. And here's how it happens through the word of God. No, he's using the alphabet. He's doing eight verses, and he's, he's, cre he's just crafting it so very carefully uh, as, a, um, as this enticement of the beauty and the worth and the value of the Word of God. 
he understands that it is. So he uses these eight different synonyms to describe, we would say, the revelation of God, God revealing himself. You call it the Bible. You call it the Word of God. Look through there, and what are some things your Bible uses or calls it instead of just the Bible? Psalm 119, any of them there. Precepts. Testimonies. What is it? Statutes. Decrees. Law. What was it? Commands. All right, here's the eight. And then let me just tell you, do, you know, the, each Bible translation gives a different nuance probably. In the Hebrew, if, they, if we were to just translate what they would probably intend to say, here are the eight. The law of the Lord. Testimonies. Word. Words. And that's two different things. Like the word, the written word, and utterance word. All right? So what God says. Like for an example, your words are as sweet as honey. You see, hearing your words, there's a whole different thing there. Precepts, statutes, commands, and rules. But then you'll have different translations using things like ordinances, decrees, judgments, paths, and ways. So if you look down through all 176 uh, verses of this, and you were to just circle every time this word is said, you know there will be only six verses out of this 176 that do not have a word for the Bible. Isn't that incredible? So you've got 170 times this writer is going to talk about a, a word describing the Bible and then what it does to it. Do you see how, how carefully crafted this is? And how, uh, you know, anybody in here poets? Marcia's a writer. I know she does this pondering a thoughts blog post. You don't just sit down and pen it out, do you? You wish you could, right? But what you do is you craft the statements. When Jenny does her lesson, I, I, don't, I don't see her notes, but I can imagine that it is so, she, before she writes them out, she has meticulously crafted that phrase to make that phrase drop and go, whoa, I get it and you breathe it in, and it makes sense, and it clings to you. That's what this author is doing. It's set in this very complex poetic form. I wish I were a poet. Um, I've tried to do some sort of poetry, but I'm just pretty stinky at it. I, um, Herschel will, will bust some out every once in a while, and I feel very intimidated if I try <laughs> back with him. So it's like, yeah, I love you. I do. <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> All right, so the immensity of the uniqueness of the Word of God is what we really need to get our brains wrapped around. You, you take, uh, like, the Word of God, and let's just contrast it to something like the Quran, all right? So the Muslims, the Islam Bible. Basically, you only get one genre in it, and it's all about commands. You think about the Word of God, and I, I hope on some way I can do what this psalmist does, and as I'm starting to say the things about the Word of God, you go, wow. It really is pretty amazing. Wow, I really do want to delve into a little more. It's The Word of God is written in three languages. Do you know what they are? Hebrew and Aramaic. So Arabic, either way. All right, and then it's written over a period of about 1,500 years by multiple authors who use their own vocabulary, their own style, their own personality as they write it. Can't you read the personality of the different writers? Can, when you think about uh, Paul writing his letters, can you sort of get the personality of Paul in your brain? When you think about James, can you see James? He, he's probably very teacher-esque. I can picture him like you, Marty, just, you know, wants to just te teach, do this, don't, you know, here's what you need to do kind of thing, that lays it out. Um, all the authors have this different way, and so you use all these multiple authors, their vocabulary, and then there's multiple genres. Think about instead of just one, we've got stories, history, genealogy, laments, songs, parables, um, letters, I meant laws, proverbs. Am I missing anything else? Everything. You got it all in there, written by these different authors, but ultimately one author, right? 
God writing all behind this. And all of it feeding together for one giant story of God self-disclosing. Is that not incredible that you have? If we were to just take the women in this room and we were to write a book and say we all end up over a long period of time with such diversity in our life and it all points to and magnifies one God. Is that not incredible when you think about it? The, the life that is in that. Psalm 119 is an alphabet basically about the word of God because it, it introduces us to the glory of God through the word of God. Alistair Begg, I love Alistair. I love listening to his stuff. If you all don't listen to Alistair Begg's sermons, get on it. <laughs> He's really, if nothing else, you'll just like his speech patterns. Um, I was driving my mother-in-law home this week, and I put on Alistair Begg, and we listened to the sermon because I needed a silence, if you know, <laughs> or, or a different kind of silence. I needed different, different words. And so we're listening to it uh, on the way there, and maybe 20 minutes in, uh, I stopped and paused the thing, and I said, isn't he good? She goes, I love his voice. And I said, yeah, but isn't he good? She goes, I can't really understand him. <laughs> but I like it. I like his I, Scottish, isn't that what he is? I think he's just wonderfully charming in his delivery. But listen to how he describes our need for commitment to the Word of God. Vital Christianity is lovingly understanding commitment to God's word because God's word introduces us to the person of God's son who unfolds the reality of God himself and shows us the wonder of the gospel. That's why God's word's so good, you all. It's because it, it shows us what cannot be seen apart from the word. We, it is the word that does it. So I may... What, what I say we do is we see God allow his glory to just breathe out his word. Isn't that what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17? All scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So let's look at what will help guide us I think, into wisdom by way of the word. Now, I have um, these notes written in one of my older Bibles that I've had for who knows how long. And I have used these notes on many times to encourage me, to remind me what I need to do with God's word and, and allow God's word to do with me. But I have to be honest with you, and I have no idea who they're from. I, don't, I tried searching up if possibly, you know, who the author might be, and I would write down all these words, and then I would put in somebody's name, and I thought, well, sure, that sounds like something Rick Warren would do. Googled it. Nope, didn't come up Rick Warren. It's like, I asked Herschel, Herschel, did you preach it? I preached it, but I don't know who did it. <laughs> uh, so I thought, well, maybe it's Adrian Rogers. I did it. Anyway, bottom line is I can't find out who to give this credit to for who uh, gave this, this outline, but I will say this also is I... Um, tweaked it. I played around with it, and I have over the years trying to do, because some words I didn't like that they used. They use every word, obviously, up here that's going to be ending in eyes. Anytime you can do some sort of phonetic thing like that to help you um, memorize something and apply something, it's going to be a, a helpful tool, like an acrostic. Like, say this uh, thing here. Don't you think you could use that to teach Bible, has anybody ever taught like the ABCs and use God's word to do the ABCs? God is all sufficient. God is beautiful. God is creative. And you, and you do that and you can implant something in them. So I think anytime you can use those phrases, uh, some of these may be forced just a little bit. So y'all live with it. <laughs> it. It still is. So I crafted this acrostic, but I reversed it a little bit. I think it is a wonderful God. Instead of starting with a certain letter, I ended with some letters, and I, I think that will do it. So let's read Psalm 119 and verse 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his ways pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. See there, you see two times already we've got uh, words for the Bible, all right? I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. 
Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my, my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. He does it twice there. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. All right, so we're going to take these few verses here. And we're going to apply one of these words to it so that we can see what we do with it. Now, again, what I uh, did last week, I'm going to encourage you to do it this week. Your homework sheet is your homework sheet. Try and take your notes all on your own, writing something like flip your paper over on the back and try not to fill in anything as we go along because what I want us to do is I want us to not just um, as we receive information, I want you later to process it again. And that's the best way that you can get something. You're not just hearing it one time. Don't get fixated on filling on any blanks or answering any questions. Be really conscious about receiving what the Word is saying here. And then go back and say, oh, now what did that say? If something happens and you just can't pull it up from any notes that you took or any of your brain pan, it, we've got it on YouTube. You can go back and look at it. So let's look at the first one. Verse 9 here. I'm going to read it again. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Which word do you think fits that? Strategize. All right. There is, there is in this text, I mean, in this little line right here, there is a prevention put in place. Do you see? He recognizes that there is a potential problem that's going to be coming up. How many of you all know in your life right now you're going to have a potential problem? Every daggone one of you. <laughs> There's not one of you in this room that will not face a potential problem. You might know what that struggle, that challenge might be, right? Anybody in here about to have teenagers? Anybody in here aging? Aging way too fast. <laughs> you know, I cannot, uh, different things are happening. You got to think, how am I going to do all these things with grace and with um, peace and with glory? It was through providing yourself with easy access to the Word of God. So I've got a couple of things um, that we can do with this. And let me find where my phone is. All right. You, you all, if, if uh, you're app users, iPhone users, this is a really good thing. Ooh, I, I like your Bible study book thingy there. Hurl, show, hold that up. That one beneath you. That right there. Isn't that? No, is that a journal kind of thingy? No, it's a, it's a Bible. It is a Bible. It's pretty. That other thing, a Bible, a journal. Okay, all right, never mind. <laughs> What's well, a lovely Bible? I saw your box there. You got, you know, a, a squirrel, you know how I am. <laughs> yeah, all right. So what? do things that provide you with easy access to the Word. You all, we are so spoiled. How many of you have more than one Bible? What, more than one version of the Bible? Access to more than one version of the Bible. If you have a cell phone, you've got access for free to many versions, to every version probably that is out there. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're putting our, the word before us. We've got, you know, it's like everything gets provided for us in such an easy fashion. Uh, what I want you and I to do is to go, I want to make sure that I've accessed my world and my heart and my thoughts and my life to the word of God. So, so I put on my phone uh, the app Dwell. Anybody familiar with this app, Dwell? It's awesome. Let me see if I can get. Um, all right. It does different things. Like you can just go through. It will read you the Bible or you can read the Bible itself on there. So it's actually my phone. But let's say um, I want to talk about, I want to study wisdom. You can explore on this app. What, I'm not trying to sell the app, you understand? I'm trying to sell you on making access to the Word of God. So I just happen to use this one as one of my tools. So it, it has playlists that you can put on. Like say, I want to walk in wisdom. I can look and search on there, and there will be something that talks about uh, the ways of wisdom. Let's say I'm feeling stressed. Can you all get that one sometimes? All right, and listen. And I like a British voice when, I, when he reads. So. Bow down within me. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His All right. mercies never come. All right, you, it, 
you all may not like his voice. They've got women, they've got children, they've got Rosie, who's British and wonderfully poppy and delightful. <laughs> you can listen to all of those. Um, it even has one on this uh, app that you can go to sleep by at night. And what I did is I bought it uh, for Father's Day for me because it was on sale. <laughs> I can get you can get it around the, any like holiday for nineteen ninety nine, and it'll be a year subscription, or you can buy like a whole year, and I forget what that is. And so I cannot, I you all, I I do not pay for apps. I am the cheapest person in the world when it comes to apps. Like I'll tell Herschel, uh, I wish I had that on my phone or something like that. It's ninety nine cents. I'm not spending ninety nine cents. <laughs> I I literally am that cheap about it. The word of God is, about, is worth nineteen ninety nine for me for a year. If that's some way to get it into me, I'm going to do that very thing. You want to make sure you've got scripture in your sight. I've got sitting on my sink right now passages of scripture. So like when I'm washing dishes, when I'm cooking, when I'm cleaning, I've got those things before my eyes. In my study, right off my bedroom, I've got scripture before my eyes. And I get very strategic about the scripture that I have. I figure out what is it um, that I have to strategize. What I'm, I'm about to encounter a season of very busy. So what can I find in the word of God that will help me know that? The psalmist here knows that the potential trip for him will be that they might wander away from purity. And so he's saying, Lord, help me not do that. Help me know how to do that. Let me use your word to guide that into my life. So what are some of the ways that might need guarding in your life? What are some of the things that you have to sort of set up? Activities, things that you might be even, you plan to engage in some sinful habit that you do on a regular basis. Or you don't plan to do it, but you know you keep falling into that same kind of habit. James 4.17 says, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So what you're wanting to do is you know there's the right thing to do and you keep not doing the right thing, then you've got to set up in place things that will help you not to do those things that you ought not do. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to do. But with that temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. It does not say he will take the temptation away. He might do that. But what is the, based on the word of God, what do we know we have? Either the absence of that temptation or the ability to endure up under that temptation. Is that what the word of God said there? So what you want to do is you want to plant those things around you so that you know it. Is greed a struggle for you? Find some stuff that the word focuses on greed. Lay not up for yourself treasures here on earth, but rather treasures in heaven. Put those kinds of scriptures before you. Is your tongue your problem? Is worry your problem? Is temper your problem? Is envy your problem? And then what you want to do is look for contrast verses not verses that just say don't do this but do this what's the opposite of greed it's not not greed right generosity so what you want to do if greed is your issue then you want to look up verses that will cause you that will make you think about being generous uh, proverbs three twenty seven: do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. How about this? How about it's not just doing something for something for somebody, but maybe you just struggle with being an encouraging voice. Maybe because you're shy. Do you think the world needs encouragement? Do you think people need to go, way to go. I'm cheering you on. This, this week, there was a mom who was trying to correct her little boy. She had gone to introduce him to somebody, and the person that she was introducing him to, he said, well, hey, how are you doing? You have a good week? And the little boy just stood there. And the mom said, you know, say, say I'm doing well. Say good. The little boy goes, I don't want to. And she said, can you give me just a minute? 
And she took that little boy and she walked him away and she st- squatted down, face level, and got in front of me. And, and she said, you're going to say good. <laughs> you're going to go back over there and you're going to look at the man who's speaking to you. And you're going to speak up and you're going to say that to him. Now, if we have to do that five more times, we're going to do it five more times. But let's just do it one more time. And I just thought, man, that was awesome. So she walked back over there, and she held his little face up, and she said, look at him. And the little kid, she lifted his chin up, and he's just standing there. I go, he ain't going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. I was just thinking, that face is saying, I ain't doing it. And she said, say good when he asks you a question. And so the man repeated it, and the little boy, who is three, three years old-ish, looks up, and he goes, good. And she said, speak up. And he said, good (laughs) and I looked at that mom and I said way to go mom way to go that's a victory right there I said let's victory dance it out (laughs) that was that you we need somebody who comes along because man it's so wearisome to say the same thing over and over again and get no results. So when you get a result, good grief, celebrate it. So if you're not one of those people who look for that kind of opportunity to do it, we need that. And so I say for you this verse, Proverbs 3.27, don't withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in your power to do it. Do it. Say that to people. Write people a note. Encourage them. Proverbs 25.11 would be one of those verses you might put up there. Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in the right circumstance. It's you saying, way to go. Way to go, friend. I'm on your team. That's great. So first one we've got is strategize. Strategize ways to let the word of God cause you to walk in wisdom. Then the next one, verse 10 With my whole heart, I will seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've got written beside this verse here, here's my heart, Lord, oh, take and seal it. I like that where he just says, with my whole heart, I will seek you. So which verse would this one, which word would this one be? Let me not wander, stabilize. All right, look to the word of God to stabilize your walk. You know what stabilizers are on an aircraft or a ship? They keep it from tilting too far one way or the other. Basically, what they're doing is they're keeping it steady along the path. Have you noticed some people or sometimes we have a tendency to blow hot and cold and moody and trust the Lord and don't trust the Lord and get all happy and then depressed and we just do that. You know what the word of God is? The word of God is a stabilizer. It keeps me from wandering around in my own self. This doesn't mean that, that you and I won't have challenging seasons. It's quite the opposite. But what it does say is it, when those seasons come, we can be stabilized in those seasons. That we don't, it, it doesn't cause us to just explode with hot and explode with cold. It's, it, is time in the word, is looking at the word that will help us to continue to be steadfast. When you have a hard season, and it's likely that you will if you have it, it will be the word of God that will help you from falling into despair. Have you all ever had a time where you are right on the cusp of despair? I mean, you're really broken hearted either over personal sin or sin that's been done to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 13 says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, and always carrying in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to the death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in your mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you, since we have the same spirit of faith, and here's what it says, according to what has been written. You understand? It's what what we read that's been written that is giving us that life, that is helping us when we're um, afflicted or perplexed or crushed, that we don't just bottom out. We don't do it. The Word of God helps stabilize our hearts. Get the Word before you. I will tell you that there will be times, there have been a season where you and I, and you know this feeling, where we have just felt right 
on the verge. Of, yeah, I, 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 I say it's, um, I'm on the ledge. Talk me off the ledge is what I, the, the, I say that to one of my daughter-in-laws. And I'll just say, man, I'm just really hanging on here by a thread. You got to talk me off the ledge. <laughs> and you know what helps me the most? Not that you got this girl kind of thing. It's like, well, the Lord knows what is before you. And he has purposed it in good ways. And she puts a scripture out there. And so when I lay down at night in my bed and I'm wrestling through season of challenge or something, it's not my reasoning that's going to help me, you all. It's the word of God. that There, I, some, there have been times, and you, many of you can identify with this, where you just go, God, I'm just crying out. I don't even know what to cry. Just Lord. Oh, Lord, have you all done that? Have you had that? And that was enough. Isn't that something? That just knowing, you know, Lord, I don't even know the words. But, Lord, you are faithful. You are true. And that will be enough. That will be what the Lord does. Then the next passage. Look at verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That would be what? Memorize. Put scripture to memory. You all, if you can stand in the worship service and sing the song without having to look at the screen the whole time, what can you do? Memorize. So don't go, well, I just can't memorize anything. Anybody have a recipe they make all the time and you don't have to look at the recipe? Anybody have a song here you don't even like? <laughs> a jingle on the television that stays in your brain? Yes, you've got all those things. You've got the ability to do it. We just have to make sure we do it. Again, there's apps that you can do it on your phone. If you're a cheat person like me, there is a Bible Memory Light. It's free. If you are not cheap and you're willing to spend $9.99, it's a one-time purchase. It gives you, here's the way it works. Let's say you want to memorize Psalm 119. And um, if you're if you do the cheap version, you only get like so many verses, and then, then you're done, and then you have to choose another passage. But for the full version, it gives you, it, there's limitless, and there's different translations and all that other stuff. So you're sort of stuck and limited, but hey, it's, I'm cheap, what can I say? Um, so it would do something like, blessed are those whose way is blameless. And so you text into your phone, bless it, and it gives you a moment, and one word will be missing. And then you text in that word. And then the next day, two words will be missing. And then once you've completed that, then they'll take another word and three words will be missing. And then four words. You can do that even with, uh, you know, three by five cards. There's, some, there, there's all kinds of ways. Do old school, do whatever you do, you know, put three by five by cards on the back of your toilet. And <laughs> every time you sit down, you read them. <laughs> whatever it takes to memorize the word of God, you want to do that. Um, you know, hiding God's word in your heart is a mighty preemptive tool. I started doing uh, certain verses when the boys were young. One of them would be Philippians 2, 14. Does anybody happen to know what that is? Do all things without? Yeah, griping, grumbling, moaning, complaining. The Greek word there, I love it, is gongosmos. That's grumbling. And so I taught the boys, doesn't it sound like grumbling? Gonga's moose. <laughs> and so I would say to them, whenever I go, do all things without Gonga's moose. <laughs> and I would say, complaining, grumbling. You sound like a grumbler. And so I planted that into their brain. Don't be gripers and complainers. I don't want, nobody wants to hear any griping and complaining here. And I have to rejoice in the fact that the Lord took that word and gave it life. My sons are not complainers. They don't grumble and complain. But I don't know how many times, have you ever heard me tell them, no more, I don't want to hear any complaints. Have y'all heard me say that to them? I know, like more than, and backhand. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I hate, the Lord hates grumbling, you all. He wiped out people for grumbling. It, it groups it in a group of like adultery and all this other stuff. And so I'm going, good grief, grumbling's a big deal. I don't want to be a grumbler. And so if you're a grumbler, put that into your vocabulary. Learn that word. What's the word? 
Look at you all. <laughs> you can Google it later if you want to use it. Uh, so, but mem memorize it. Memorize whatever thing that you need in your life. Uh, next, personalize will be the word. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach who? Me your statutes. When you listen to the preaching of the word or the reading of the word, what we're doing is I, and sometimes I hope he's listening. I hope my kid heard that. I hope my husband heard that. <laughs> I hope as my husband preaches that he heard that. <laughs> what I want to do is I, the, it's meant for the Holy Spirit to affect me. And I want to go, Lord, help me hear what you say to me. And we want to make sure as we're reading, after we've really recognized the Bible's really about God, he's still personally speaking to me. There's things he's teaching me, and so do that. And then verse 13, in the way of your testimonies I delight, as much as in all ritual, as riches. What would that would be? Oh, I skipped one. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. Verse 13. What would that be? Verbalize. Talk about things in the, uh, that are in the word of God, in your home, in your social network forum, at work, at school, where it is. And if you're reticent about saying the simple basic statements that we claim to value most basic at our in our life more than anything then I have to ask you how highly do you value it if I can so readily talk about fried green tomatoes and how I delight in them do I really value the word of God if I don't more eagerly and um, often talk about Oh, man, the word is so good. The Lord is so good. Just talking about the Lord, not just necessarily doing it. Uh, you're speaking of the grace it holds to people by saying things like, the Lord just gave us such a beautiful day today. You understand the value of that phrase? We've got a whole world who is verbalizing every thought that they believe that's so far off the chart. And we Christians are going, well, we got to separate uh, church from state and we got to make sure we're not saying anything that's going to throw up red flags and offend anybody y'all they're already offended they're offended by our existence they're offended by the thoughts of us not saying anything so heck say something start putting the lord's vocabulary out there you can say things like i have some hard news that i received this week and i don't know how i could handle it if i didn't know the lord you understand that's, that's putting things out there that sometimes people will grasp on and they go, well, I've got hard things too. So it's the Lord who helps you hard things and it opens up doors for that. Sometimes it's verbalizing hard things. Like uh, you've got somebody in your life who says, you know, well, my husband and I, we just, it's really a hard marriage. We really shouldn't have ever gotten married and I know God wants me to be happy. What you do, you, what do you do there? Where do where you go with that one? You know, they were bold enough to say something, that bonehead, right? That you can be bold enough to say back. That's a bold statement of something they've said, right? So get bold back and say something to the degree. You know, God doesn't place your happiness over your holiness. But your personal, personal holiness can lead to incredible contentedness. Now, when you say that word contented, sometimes we Christians don't look at that word the right way when you said, well, I'm just going to content myself in the Lord. You know what that, what most of the time we're meaning when we say that? I'm just going, I'm just going to deal with it. I'm just going to do what? Stuff it, Stuff it down. I'm just going to content myself. I'm going to do it. Now, how many of you all, if, if you were to say, man, I was so contented. Where will you, what are you doing if you say that phrase? What might you be doing if you go, oh, I'm just so contented? On vacation. <laughs> Where on vacation? A beach soaking in the waves. The temperature's just perfect. you got a snack and a beverage <laughs> and a friend or quiet. <laughs> Whatever. You know, it's just you're contented. That's what contentedness is. And so when I say to somebody, you know, the Lord's more uh, concerned about your holiness than he is your happiness, and your holiness can lead to contentedness, hear me say what contentedness really looks like. It's not just a resignation to just suffer through. And then I explain contentedness. 
I said, oh, man, that's what the Lord can do in our lives. That's what the Lord has done in my life and many seasons and done in your life. Uh, let the word just roll off your lips. Talk about things. If you, you know, talk about things in your home. Talk about things with your children. In number 14, I already read this verse. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. What would that one be? Vitalize. Uh, vitalize is something where it just uh, it enlivens something. It gives life to it. It's, you know, think about this. Delight in you even more than riches. Can you imagine if, if we really thought, okay, somebody's going to drop a million dollars on me today, and I go, that would be delightful, right? But that I would delight more, that's what the psalmist says, I would delight more in your word than I would delight in somebody dropping a million dollars on me. You all, we, we, it, the being under the word makes us value it. Makes it, <clears throat> it comes to life. It begins to become more valuable to us. It's like the more you have it and hold it and study it and treasure it, the more you have it and hold it and study and treasure it. It feeds off of itself. That's what it does. That's what the Word of God does. And then verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your way. That one would be scrutinize, examine closely, search it, study it, meditate on what it says. Uh, the Word of God can handle scrutiny. It stands up under the test of time. You, many, many, many generations have tried to wipe it out and cause it to be foolishness and do it. And what still stands? The Word of God. Is that not incredible? Do you know anything that has withstood the test of time more than the Word of God? It is, it's why it's really important that we actually do scrutinize it, that we look at it. It's, it's where we meditate on it. Now, when I say meditate, I don't mean like worldly meditation. It's not like you're clearing your mind of, no, of everything till you get to nothingless and meaninglessness. First of all, who can do that? What it is do, it's not just pondering on nothingness. It's not like going, oh, centering my thoughts on my belly button. <laughs> I mean, that is what a world is trying to convince us. You don't think on anything. If you, don't, if you remove your thoughts of all thoughts, guess what thoughts come in? Crazy thoughts. Y'all ever do that? You just go, I'm just trying not to think on anything, and then you think crazy thoughts. <laughs> You, what we're talking about is I have to just let the Word of God just sort of set on me, and I begin to think about it. It's setting still long enough to center on what you've just heard spoken, what you've just heard taught, what you've just read, whatever it is. And sometimes I'll tell you, I'll be sitting in because I, I have a busy brain that won't stop do thinking about all the things I have to do. Did anybody else str struggle with that problem? Like I sit down and I go, okay, I want to read the Word of God. I begin reading the Word of God and I go, you should have put the laundry in, the dryer. The laundry is wet in the bath, I mean, in the washing machine and now it's going to be wrinkly. And so it's like, so I go, oh, focus, focus. And so I just go, okay, and then, and, and, you, oh, and you should go ahead and get the mail in. Well, if you get the mail in, if you stop and you get the mail in, what are you going to do? I open the mail, and then when you got to throw the trash away, and then all that just throws away. So here's what I do. When I sit down, I have, instead of a to-do list, I have do-later list. <laughs> Don't do now list. So I can write it on there and just leave it. Does that make sense? Sounds kind of hokey, but it works for me. Maybe it'll work for you. So I'll be reading, and I'll go, oh, you got to put the laundry in, and I'll just write down laundry. And then I can go back, and I just start saying, Lord, here's what your word says. And then I go, oh, mail. Mail. <laughs> and then I just keep going. And that just helps me uh, be able to set still. Setting still is not an easy thing for women. We are multitaskers to the max. Am I right? Y'all, I, I, in my marriage class, one of the things that I say that I can do, like Herschel and I will sit down to do a movie. I will have the newspaper. I will polish my nails. I will watch TV. And I will eat snacks. And if I say to Herschel, 
hey, babe, and he'll get the remote, and he'll stop the thing, and he'll go, what? Because <laughs> he can't concentrate <laughs> on anything. That all, all that multi, women do that, and sometimes that's a good thing, and many times, especially under the Word of God, it's not. It's like, Lord, your priority. I'm going to make sure I'm stepping back and I'm doing it. Because here's what we want to do. We want um, to do things like, it, it might be something like taking a thought from a sermon or a lesson you hear, and you just chew on it. You all know, I've, I've used this illustration before, and it's not very glamorous, but it's really, it works, and it's good. You know cows have four compartments in their stomach, right? So what they do is they go over, and they will chew on fescue in one field that morning. And they'll put it down and um, they'll put it in their belly. And then they'll wander over to another field and there's bluegrass over there. And they'll chew on bluegrass and they'll get some rye and they'll swallow that down. And those four compartments sort of move those foods around. And then they'll go back to the barn and there's no food in the barn. They're laying down in their stall. But have you ever noticed, even though there's no food around and it's not been, uh, he's not just been in a field and that cow will be going, Y'all have seen it before? You know what he's doing? He's chewing what? His cud. Do you know what the cud is? It's what was in his stomach that he had eaten earlier that he brought back up. I'm sorry. That's gross. But it's good. <laughs> Isn't that a great analogy, though? <laughs> that's what we want to do. We want to hear the word of God and we chew on it. And in that moment, we can't get all the nutrients out of it that we need to get out of it. We got other things that are going on. When you're hearing Herschel preach and he's saying things and you're going, oh, that's good. And then you're moving on to the next point. And you've already, by the time the evening comes, you've probably let go of that point that you sat there for a moment and went, wow, that's really good. What we want to do with the word of God is bring that back up. Bring that up back later. That's why, you all know, they send out in email form, it's on Instagram, it's on Facebook, things to help you think on God's Word. Like this week, you would have gotten um, the prepare for the sermon, Romans 5, verses 12 through 21, and then there were four questions that you were to answer before. Why do we do that? It's so that it makes it sort of stick in your brain. And you're, you're already chewing on something like that. And then a lot of times you go to community groups, and what do you do in the community groups? You rehearse the sermon. You understand that's what we have to do with the Word of God. You've got to scrutinize it and take it and, and explain it and do it. Learn to love those things. Think about this. Look over at uh, Exodus chapter 24. <clears throat> All right, so Moses is talking to a, a multiple amount of people out there. And I'm going to pick up in verse 4 and listen to this. <clears throat> and Moses, he's, you know, so God has given him words, commands, laws, things he needs to write down. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in a basin and half of the blood he threw against the altar. He took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. Now, you all, that would be a lengthy reading. He's standing up and he's reading that. Now, here's what I want you all to know is at, then Moses, after that, after that reading, he goes up for 40 days and 40 nights. Do those people have that book in their hand? What do they have? Their memory of, of ruminating. What did Moses say? What were the things that he said? They paid attention to, in order to implement that into their lives. And then they, they basically said to him all that the word says. And they said all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. How did they know what to do and be obedient to? They rehearsed that in their brains. And when they stopped rehearsing it, what did they do? Dumb things. <laughs> when they stopped thinking on those things, it... You know, we are so spoiled that we have the ability to have God's word right before us to meditate on us. We've got YouTube videos to bring that back up. And I fear we've lost the discipline of meditating and chewing on the word of God. 
It's like, well, we're just like little birds. You know, I, I, every year I raise two nests of birds that I say I raise them. You know what I mean? I, I, I make all of the surroundings just right. So these birds come back and they build nests. And they build it in the same, this little light, and there's poop they have to deal with and all that kind of stuff. But I so enjoy these little birds, and I take videos and send them to the little children, and the little kids all just think it's the coolest thing in the world. You know, they go, oh, Miss Tanya's got, you know, Miss Tanya's got baby birds. Well, I don't really have them. But anyway, so I, I watch the mom or the dad, whichever the case may be, fly into this little lantern that's on my back porch, and those little birds just open up their mouth. Yeah, and mom pokes the food in, and then they're gone. And it's just like those birds don't do anything until they're ready to fly. And then they're off on their own. And then they got no mom feeding them. And they got everything. And I just think, you know, we're sometimes we're like little baby birds. It's like we're just like, okay, give me, give me food. Feed, feed me what I need to know. You know what? Uh, the Holy Spirit can give you what you need to know in the message, but he can't give you all you need to know. Sometimes that's you and the Lord. Only you and the Lord know. You know, the Lord can lead, and the Holy Spirit can lead Herschel to hit some things in your life, but he can't hit all of the things in your life. Only you and the Lord can do those things. And so we have to really learn how to meditate on those things. And then lastly, verse 16. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. You all, what's the word? Prioritize. There's things that matter to you, you prioritize. Things that you want, you value, you will make happen. It's just the, the way that our lives are. And if the word matters to you, then you have to figure out ways to re- prioritize it. Nothing replaces God's word. No podcast of wise people. No preaching on Sunday only. No reading a good book about Christianity it, none of that replaces God's word. Look, look over here in verse 164, and I want you to listen to this. Seven times a day I will praise you for your righteous rules. So what's happening? What's he saying he's doing? He's, how, how many, seven times a day. He's, Lord, thank you for your word. So what do we know he's doing at least seven times a day? He's thinking about God's word. I can't help but to compare that with uh, the Muslims who five times a day get a call to prayer. You know, Dana, we were in Israel, and, man, they get their call, and those people stop whatever they're doing five times a day. Sometimes it's three minutes. Sometimes it's 20 minutes a day. And I'm going, those people don't even have a God full of grace and truth. They have a book of commands that they don't even have any control. To, it, they have no, it's like if Allah wills, that's their belief system. They're fatalist. And we have a gracious God who orders our steps and guides us and loves us and communes with us on a regular basis. And I go, my goodness, if they can stop five times a day, whatever they're doing, and focus on the word of God or, the, or God, their God, I'm going, why would I not be more prone like the psalmist and go, well, I can do seven times a day. Pull that up. You know, in this song, we, the psalm, we see how he eagerly applies himself to the task of understanding the word. He longs for it in his heart. He learns from it. He draws more wisdom from it. And mostly what he is doing is as he studies it, he begins seeing the glory of God and God revealing himself to him. You know, there is nothing more beautiful than remember when Moses is standing up on the mountain and the Lord says, I will cause my glory to pass before you. And he puts Moses back up in the rock and he shows him just his hinder quarters. He doesn't go, here's my glory (laughs) coming before you. He just gives him the backside. And Moses lights up. It just makes him overwhelmed to have been, experienced the glory of the Lord. It shows on his countenance. It shows to when he comes down from the mountain, what's it say that he does? His face was so shining. Remember what he does? He puts a veil over his face because that glow is going to dissipate because he's not in the glory of the Lord anymore the presence of the Lord you all we have we're not we're more fortunate than Moses 
Do you understand that? I don't have to ascend to a mountain and then wait till he calls me back up. I don't have to wait for a burning bush. I got this so freely at my disposal. That is the glory of God. It's him showing, here's who I am, here's what I do. It's God, this psalm here is so beautiful. If it doesn't make you go, I want to love the word more, then you have to ask the Lord to help you to want, to change your wanter. <laughs> because this psalm is so beautiful, and you and I have the privilege of seeing before us the glory of the Lord through the word of God. Let me pray. Father, praise you for your word. Praise you that you didn't choose to just create us and leave us off on our own devices and own wisdom. Lord, you, you wrote us a beautiful story that we can look at and it is breathing into our life truth and grace and peace and everything lovely, Lord. And I ask you, Father, that as I wander into my own, I got this, that you will draw me back so quickly to your word. And I will say, I can do nothing apart from you, Lord. May you take your word and help me um, scrutinize it, prioritize it, um, vitalize it. Lord, I just pray that all those things, Lord, that it promises that it will do, I know to be true that I will know it enough to be true, that I will begin to make it part of my life more and more. And it's in your son Christ's name I pray.